Hello and welcome to Office Hours where I answer your questions about weight and weight medicine. I'm Dr. Megan. I'm a board certified physician in internal medicine, lifestyle medicine, and obesity medicine. And this is really important because I actually prescribe these medications all the time. I actually talk to patients about their weight all the time. I've helped hundreds of patients lose weight and I'm here to help you too. So if you are confused about your weight, if you have questions about weight medication, and if you want medically based answers to your weight questions, you are in the right place. So let's get into it. I'm gonna answer your questions. If you have questions afterwards, you can definitely leave them in the comment section below or on one of the videos. If I haven't gotten to your question yet, it is on the list. Do not worry, I will get to it. Um, and as a caveat, as always, I can't answer personal medical questions because I'm not your personal doctor. So I may have to change your question a little bit so it's not so personal, so we make it more broadly educationally applicable. So with that being said, let's get started. Okay, this first question is great. Um, I'm gonna change it a little bit so we make it, we depersonalize it a little. Um, basically, um, someone was on Wagovi for a year and a half, they are on ZepBound at a low dose, but they feel like it's not working. Um, their, their question is, in, would it be possible in theory to use Sexend and ZepBound together? Great question. Um, no, you would not want to do that. And I'll tell you why I would not prescribe Sexend and ZepBound together because essentially they are doing the same thing. Thing. So that would be like taking um, like Tylenol and extra strength Tylenol. Like you just wouldn't want to, you, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, they are both GLP-1 receptor agonists. So they activate the same um, pathway in the GI tract. Now ZepBound is a little bit different because it is a dual agonist. So it's activating both the GLP-1 pathway and the GIP pathway. And I made a whole a lot of videos on ZepBound, so you could definitely check those out. But um, yeah, you just, you wouldn't take them together because they do the same thing and there's no research currently to suggest that combining them um, is a good idea or is safe. And I, I would just be really worried about side effects too. Like they could, I mean, in, in addition to kind of like doing the same thing, um, you're just at increased risk of side effects. Like if it's not you can play around with different ones. Like sometimes, you know, Saxenda won't work for somebody, but Wagovi will or Zepbound will. So just because one doesn't work doesn't mean another one won't work, but you just wouldn't want to combine them. That would not, currently that is not something that we do and it is not something that I would feel that it would be a safe option for somebody. Now, I did make a video um, recently about how long things should take too. So um, if somebody's on a very low dose of a medication, whether you're on the starting dose of Saxenda, Wagovi, or ZepBound, I am not expecting any particular weight loss at that time. You that, that initial dose is really just to help your body get used to the medication and see what the side effects are like. So I would never, if somebody said, oh, I've been on, you know, ZepBound 2.5 or Wagovi, you know, 0.25 for, you know, a month or two months and I haven't lost any weight, that would not bother me. I would still continue to go up on it because especially with ZepBound, there is a real rent, you're going up to 15. So um, sometimes people just don't see effects until they are at the higher end of the spectrum. And sometimes people, I also have patients that, that do see results earlier, but it's not, it's really not uncommon to not see, um, results initially. It doesn't mean anything has gone wrong. It's, we're just letting your body just like dipping your toe in the, in the baby end of the pool. So your body gets used to it. So, cause uh, obviously we don't, want anybody to have horrific side effects. So, um, so we're just letting your body get used to it. And then, um, if I had somebody that wasn't go, you know, wasn't losing weight, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter as long as they're not having horrible side effects. Um, I am just going to continue to escalate the dose, um, per protocol, um, until either we reach the maximum dose or they're getting their intended effect on a lower dose or they're having really significant side effects. So that is a great question that I have not actually been asked before. And I think a lot of people needed to hear that. So thank you. 
Um, all right. So next question is, this is, this isn't so much of a question, but I just, I wanted to share it because I think there's a lot of, um, additional benefits that these medications provide. And I think this gives a good view as to the, the other, the ancillary benefits from being on a GLP-1. So I'm on seven point, this is about Zepbound. I'm on 7.5 milligrams. My weight is going down slow, but I've been on Zepbound since February, 2024. I did 2.5 and five. I'm on 7.5 and I've lost 35 pounds. The weight is slow, about a pound every week. I don't really want to lose weight fast, but the good part is it helps with my arthritis and swelling in my knee and also my anxiety and my depression. So I take that for a win. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to bring this up because we talk a lot about all the, you know, the weight related benefits of the medications, but there are so many other, and we talk a lot about the side effects, right? There's a lot of side effects and we have to take these medications seriously, but there are also a lot of really nice additional benefits that happen for people, for some people who are on these medications. So, um, they do seem to really help sometimes if people have a lot of, um, inflammatory issues because, and which isn't totally surprising because fatty tissue, adipose tissue does have inflammatory properties, especially in excess. And so, um, the less in the less fatty tissue you have, the less excess, um, inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory, um, material you have circulating in the body. And so while we're still really at the very beginning stage of learning about this and you know what that means for people with inflammatory diseases. If I had a patient that had um, you know psoriatic arthritis and was on a GLP-1, am I going to be surprised with that their also their arthritis is feeling better as they're losing weight? No, um, we don't currently prescribe this for. This isn't an, an indication for these issues yet. And who knows what, you know, we're again, still at the very beginning stages of learning what these medications can do for people. But, um, you know, certainly for uh, things such as, you know, osteoarthritis at more wear and tear um, arthritis, when people are having real mechanical stress, as you alleviate the weight, because weight is also, weight is inflammatory stress and it's mechanical stress, just the sheer stress of more pounds on joints, um, as you alleviate the pounds on joints, um, your joints are going to feel better. But there is also this kind of non-mechanical inflammatory benefit that can also occur for some people. So um, so thank you for um, writing in because I think a lot of people, that's kind of a nice benefit that they weren't necessarily expecting. It doesn't happen for everybody, but it's nice to know that that can happen. And also, yes, mood-related issues can also improve a lot. Um, of course, um, of course, there are, you know, cases where uh, people's moods can be, you know, adversely impacted by these medications. And again, we're still learning more about that. But I would say, in terms of you know my clinical experience, the vast majority of people, their mood improves dramatically as they're losing weight. They're feeling better. They can move around more. And so this can really help with things like anxiety and depression um, and just help people feel like their life is kind of getting this momentum in the direction that they want. And that can be very powerful for people. So um, again, doesn't happen for everybody, but is a nice added benefit. And I don't think we talk about those enough. We talk so much about the side effects and all the things that can go wrong, but there are these little nice surprises when things are kind of like, oh, that's nice too, right? Okay, switching gears. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna change this one a little too. Essentially, uh, this is a very common question about somebody who has been on a GLP-1 and then they're having surgery and then what should they do when they restart the dose? So um, usually, and now every surgeon is different and it depends on the type of surgery, but typically um, because the medications, because the GLP-1 medications slow the movement of food through the stomach, um, you can imagine that that's going to have an impact in terms of, you know, you can't eat or drink so many hours before surgery. Well, if your GI tract is slowed, um, you have to take that into account 
or you have to um, stop the medication. And so usually what happens is stop the medication two weeks before, let it wear off. It's not going to wear off completely, but let it let the effect wear off to such an extent that it's safer to do the surgery under anesthesia. So um, usually about two weeks, and then depending on the surgery, when should you be restarting it and at what dose? So I can't, you know, every surgery is different, and so it's really going to depend on it's always going to depend on the, the, the surgeon to tell the patient when to resume that medication, when it'd be safe for them, depending on the type of surgery that they have. But a lot of people wonder, hey, should I be, if I was on like Wagovi 1.0 or 1.7, and then I've been off it for three weeks, what, should I just go back on that same dose? I would, because also you have to take into account, um, sometimes these, maybe somebody, this was like the first month that they could find that dose too. So the shortage really affects medical care in these kinds of situations because it sometimes it's really just an access issue on top of everything else. So all that is, so let's say I had a patient and they were on Wagovi 1.7 and they'd been off for two weeks. Then they had their surgery. Their surgeon says they can restart this a week later. So they've been off it now for three weeks. Um, all things, if, if we can get any dose possible, I would probably dial it back to like Wagovi 0.5 and then escalate up every month from there. You know, these you're on these medications for the rest of your life. So it's not a race and you want to make sure you're doing these things safely and comfortably because you also don't want to feel like you don't want to be out of work because you have a crippling stomach pain um, due to the side effects that you went back on the same dose, right? So that's the hard part is, um, let's say, so let me just back up for a second. If So yes, I would start that person at 0.5 probably, then go up every month, um, you know, escalate the dose. However, let's say there's a big shortage available or the patient is paying out of pocket and they're like, I just... I really can't afford to get all these other doses because these are the ones I have that have already kind of built up. You, it's just really a conversation of like, hey, um, if you start back on 1.7, it's going to be, it's, it's highly likely that it's going to be very uncomfortable. And so we want to make sure that we're doing this as safely as possible. We all, you know, we want to mitigate the side effects as much as possible. And usually by that point, people kind of know what they, what the big side effects are for them. So some people get a lot of constipation. Some people get a lot of diarrhea. Some people get nauseous and vomit. So you kind of have a good idea of where things are going to go if they are having side effects. But, you know, you always have to be on the lookout. These side effects could be stronger. If somebody has a lot of constipation. You have to be more wary of things like, you know, the rare scary things like a small bowel obstruction or something like that. So it's really just a conversation about what the, you know, what the options are, what the patient is comfortable, and then like what is like physically accessible for them as well. So in an ideal world, yes, you're going back a couple doses and titrating up slowly. Um, it's going to also depend on the patient's comfort level and then what's available for them as well. So thank you for that excellent question. And then our last question is going to be a question about um, medication interaction. So, and I have had a bunch of these. So if I haven't answered yours yet, it definitely will get answered in one of the upcoming videos. But, um, a lot of people have questions about if they're on a certain medication and then they have, um, so, you know, like what can they take for the side effects or if they have a headache, what can they take? Um, or, you know, this is what they normally take and is that okay? So, um, Sometimes, so one of the questions that comes up sometimes is, you know, I'm on this pain medication and I'm thinking about taking a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, do these, is that going to be a big issue? So um, like, is there a medication interaction between them? So one question is, is there a medication interaction, a significant interaction between Tylenol with codeine and um, the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So um, no, there actually is not um, all three Sixenda 
Wagovi and um, Zepbound um, can be taken with Tylenol with codeine. Um, there's no, you know, big red flag there. But and and as always, you know, the, this is not check with your prescribing physician if this relates to you. Um, this is just for educational purposes. But um, in theory, there's no medication interaction. However, you do want to be very careful because. Um, codeine is an opioid and opioids can also slow the, um, movement of the GI tract, particularly they can slow the movement of, um, they can make people very constipated. Let me just put it that way. So, um, you're always at risk for constipation when you have an opioid, whether that's something like codeine, Oxycontin, Vicodin, like any of those, it's going to be a risk. And so if you're adding on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, you need to be aware that that could also, that could worsen the constipation. Now it could be the opposite effect. You could be the person that has diarrhea on the GLP-1 receptor agonist and, and they'll just kind of cancel each other out. But it's good to be aware that that is a potential interaction. You certainly don't want to be one of those people who, because the, you know, severe constipation is, is no joke. Um, and it can have a lot of other significant medical issues such as a small bowel obstruction or nausea and vomiting and a host of other complications. So just something to be aware of, um, and always talk to your physician if you have questions about particular medication combinations that you are on. But I know this comes up for a lot of people and I've gotten a lot of questions about different types of medication interaction questions. So I will do my best to answer those in theory about whether they um, interact or not. But in terms of your uh, personal medical care, of course, always check in with your prescribing physician. So that's going to do it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you have questions afterwards, you can definitely um, add them down below um, or you can add them to the video if you want to work with me directly. I will leave that information down below. Thank you so much for watching and please be well.